Turkington, and welcome to the latest edition of the Turkington Report. Uh, today's show is about something uncomfortably close to all Cape and Islands towns, which is our disappearing coastline. And uh, my guests today are uh, Jim O'Connell, who is the man of many uh, titles here. Let's see if I have them all. Coastal geologist uh, at the Sea Grant Program at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and also uh, working with the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension Service. That's Did I get that? You got <laughs> it <good>. correct. <laughs> well, Cheryl has an equally uh, brilliant resume, but uh, at the moment her, her job is Executive Director of the Sconset Beach Preservation Fund, which is uh, tackling what is likely to be the biggest beach nourishment uh, proposal uh, ever proposed on, on the Cape and the Islands. Uh, so, welcome. And, uh, Thank, you. Thanks for, Thank you. Thanks for coming. Nice to be here. Yeah. Uh, Jim has been a resource for this group that I was appointed to recently, the uh, Coastal, uh, what do we call ourselves? Hazards Coastal Commission. Hazards Commission. And uh, Cheryl has been to most of the meetings. So, Jim, why don't you give a, just a brief summary of what, what has been going on here on Cape Cod, particularly regarding the beaches and the shorefront, and, and what is what's sort of the current state of affairs? Mm. Well, my, my specialty, Eric, and Cheryl knows this as well, is is uh, analyzing historic shoreline changes and looking at various erosion control and storm uh, mitigation measures, uh, particularly looking at development practices along the shore, both historically and, and what we're doing presently. Um, given that, uh, being with the Oceanographic Institution and Cooperative Extension, one of my responsibilities is to, to take my technical uh, knowledge of what's going on uh, presently and finding out what the current state of the science is. You know, is there anything new on the horizon that we might be able to use that will uh, not only protect environmental resources, but allow people to live along the shore and enjoy the shore while living uh, in, in harmony with dunes and beaches and barrier beaches and salt marshes and so forth. Uh, I've been in this arena for uh, over 20 years studying shoreline development and, and, and shoreline change. And I've um, recently, working with the um, USGS and Woods Hole with uh, state coastal zone management funds, we updated a shoreline change database that goes back to the mid-1800s. So we have about 150 years worth of shoreline change data. Um, the, briefly, the results of that data are suggesting that uh, not only is approximately 60 to 70 percent of the Massachusetts shore, including the Cape and Islands, uh, exhibiting a long-term erosional trend, what we're noticing in the data is particularly since the 1950s, the erosion rates in many areas and on the Cape and the islands and elsewhere has, has accelerated. And it has accelerated for a couple of reasons. One, sea level is continuing to rise, but more importantly, human activity along the shore in affecting the sediment or sand supplies of these beaches uh, is being walled up behind a lot of our protective measures. So we're at a point now, I think we're at a very critical point now where we need to look at um, how we're managing the shore uh, to hopefully to do things better, to allow us again to live along the shore, um, to continue to live along the shore and enjoy the shore, but to keep the environmental resources um, healthy. So, and I think that was um, probably one of the premises that uh, was the uh, beginnings of the Coastal Hazards mm -hmm. Commission was to sort of look at where we are presently, which uh, I think we're at a very critical stage. And if we don't, I think, improve our practices, um, I think the environment and the property values are going to deteriorate. So I think this Coastal Hazards Commission timing uh, was perfect. So I think what we're doing now is looking at what we've done in the past and can we do can we do a better job? And I, I, I think we need to seriously look at everything we're doing if we want to improve the situation. Mm -hmm. Jim has brought with him uh, uh, some slides, I guess the phrase is, on, on a DVD that, that are going to be interspersed. Cheryl is actually running a group over in Nantucket that is at the forefront of of trying to do something. They, they have a really extreme situation over there. Could you tell us uh, wh what it is and, and what you're trying to do with it? Sure, um, Eric. Uh, in 1992, some homeowners on the eastern shore of Nantucket got together and decided that their collective resources would 
spend some of their own funding to try to do research and development on erosion. How was the shoreline changing out there and what kinds of strategies were available for them to try to preserve their shoreline. And I think they learned very quickly by um, submitting permits for various kinds of protective measures that there aren't very many opportunities for shoreline property owners to preserve their shoreline. And so they have uh, put forth different permits. At one point, they got a permit to do what's called dewatering, which was trying to take the water out of the sand faster than usual. And I'm giving you the non-scientific version. I'm sure Jim could correct me with yeah. the, the science, but from a layman's perspective and leaving the sand more on the beach. And they were uh, eventually permitted to try those, but that particular technology wasn't good for that environment. I think it's a very highly dynamic environment out in Sconset, and we need something really more comprehensive and uh, long-term than these temporary measures that they've tried over the past. And about a year and a half ago, they got together and determined that the risk of losing property was becoming so urgent that their values were plummeting, as Jim has suggested, and that it made sense for them economically to put their resources together and try to permit a beach nourishment project, which is going offshore, finding a sand source that's compatible with the sand that exists on their beach, and try to build out a wider and higher beach so that their shoreline is not getting as rapid of the accelerated erosion that they're experiencing right now. So we are forging the way and trying to do something really big and comprehensive that hasn't happened in Massachusetts in the past. And thanks to your office, we were able to get this commission going in the state level. Now, as you mentioned, it, it hasn't been done in Massachusetts very much. And it has been done other places like New Jersey, Florida. New Jersey, Florida, North Carolina. Most of the eastern shoreboard, sh shoreboard has done um, some type of a beach nourishment project with offshore sand source. Okay, how come we haven't, Jim? Uh, um, a couple of reasons. It, it, and it is done from New Jersey south all the way down to Florida and done routinely. Uh, the costs are shared both by the property owners in the state and the federal government. It, 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 in my uh, opinion, my perspective, it hasn't been done very often in Massachusetts because we don't have as long a uh, summer season, a warm, a warm season. So the cost benefit, the cost effectiveness of a large beach nourishment project, um, the sites need to be need, need to be uh, picked carefully. Mm -hmm. um, small beach nourishment projects, say less less than a half mile, um, really do not have a lot of longevity. Uh, therefore, it may not be cost effective. But it really depends on the the infrastructure that you're trying to protect will really dictate. Um, um, how much money you're willing to put into a beach nourishment project. But it's primarily just a short season that we have. Uh, so historically, we have not done a lot of beach nourishment in Massachusetts. The largest project to date was done on Revere Beach um, but with the Corps of Engineers, about a million cubic yards of sand and, and several subsequent uh, re-nourishment uh, projects. There were three small neighborhood um, beach nourishment projects that were actually engineered and denied, uh, designed on the south side of the Cape. Um, that did meet a, uh, the cost benefit uh, and longevity. So it can be successful given the right uh, parameters and the right site. Yeah, where, where were those? Uh, those were in um, Dead Neck and Katuit, um, uh, and the other two were in uh, one in one in um, Long Beach in, in um, uh, Barnstable, mm -hmm. and the other was uh, Great Island in Barnstable. Oh. But those? my understanding yeah. was that those weren't truly offshore sand sources, that those were a dredging of navigation ways that is a little bit easier to permit? Yeah. Um, actually, there was a combination, a combination of offshore source, near shore source, and from navigation channels. Okay. So it's actually combined looking, at, they actually came from those three environments. So when they did try the uh, Yarmouth project, they did go to an offshore site, but the weather conditions were such that the barge was inoperative for too long and the cost benefit was starting to drop. So they actually did go into the navigation channel into Hyannis Harbor and did get compatible material from that site. So it, so it can be done. Okay, so it's safe to say the ones, most of the ones we've done have been dredging of an adjacent body of water, taking that sand and putting it on a nearby beach. Correct. Right. Or upland oh. sources, which is yeah. coming from a, a mine somewhere. Right. The, the, the Revere Beach project actually came from an upland source, right. the old I-95 really? embankment. Really. Now uh, the downside of that is you got a million truck trips right. bringing your sand, uh, and people, <laughs> you know, people don't want to see that happen either. Yes. And if you have yes. a long beach that you're trying to protect, by the time you get there, you actually start to lose some of the value of 
beets you nourished while you're trying to get the remainder of it built because it takes much longer. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's very site specific, yeah. whether you go offshore right. or to an inland source. They both have pros and cons, and you need to weigh that based on the, mm -hmm. the situation that you're in. Now, the other downside of the offshore sites are, are the environmental impact. I guess the fishering, fisheries people in particular have concerns about taking great quantities of sand away from where they are now and putting them on the beach. Is that fair? Yes, yes, very much so. In the mid-Atlantic states and in Florida and so forth, most of the sand for the beach nourishment projects uh, comes from come from the tidal from the tidal channels, from the from the ebb tidal deltas, the sands that's just on the on the outside, or on the flood deltas that are inside the inlets. A lot of the sand comes from those locations, but they have gone to the offshore sites as well. The, one of the big issues up here with the offshore sand um, sources, which uh, the Nantucket that folks are going through now is uh, because of our lack of familiarity with dredging large quantities of sand offshore we're really not we're really not sure of what the impacts are and again it's very site specific so their, their project is going to a quite a, an exhaustive environmental impact uh, analysis right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell me about the western side of Falmouth we've got uh, a number of beaches that at high tide uh, aren't beaches mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a fairly new phenomenon um, yeah. what, what, what do you think, what can, what can be done about that and, and uh, what's the long-term prospect uh, for those areas? Yeah. Um, actually, in my observations around the Cape, there are many areas now, and particularly as I had mentioned, particularly since the, since the 1950s, 1960s, mm -hmm. because of uh, protecting upland property, uh, we've lost the, the major sand source to our beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches. That's the major source is the erosion of these glacial uplands, and to protect upland property, we're building seawalls and revetments and bulkheads and so forth, and we're, we're cutting off that sand supply. So as sea level continues to rise, we're ending up with um, beaches narrowing, and in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. uh, Dennis, East Ham, Falmouth, many areas we're seeing forced high water up against these structures. So we ask ourselves, what, what can we do about that? And I think the, the most appropriate thing to do is if we have artificially removed the source of sand to these areas, then I think it's probably our responsibility to think about putting some of that sand back into the, into the system. Again, looking at the, where can we get appropriate sources to supplement what we have removed from the system. Now, there's only two or three possibilities. One is to take all of this armor, as it were, down <laughs> and let nature take its course. And that's probably unlikely given the, the wherewithal of the people who put the armor up, up in the first place. Um, yeah. So then you're left with offshore sources or trucking it in, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, both of them have problems. Yeah, yeah uh, I think I think it's unrealistic to think that the great majority of people are just going to abandon their properties right. and walk away from it. I just think it's unrealistic. There may be cases um, like the Coastal Resources Working Group in Falmouth has suggested that you look at look at the shoreline and see whether there may be appropriate uh, sites that you might be able to free up as a sediment source. But I'm not sure. Nobody's sure how. Uh, how exhaustive those sources may be. So I think, th in reality, I think we do need to look at um, off-site sources, whether it be inland or whether it be um, offshore. Mm -hmm. um, I, I visited Woodle Woodneck Beach just this morning, yeah. um, and this was not an erosion project, but because of the lack of sediment, and that's not just uh, not just from human activity, but you know uh, the, the moraine deposits, the glacial deposits don't have some of them don't have a lot of source of sand in them. Right. So a lot of the beaches are pebbly, cobbly, and particularly Woodneck, you have cockle shells. So they put a veneer of sand over the beach that will probably last for the summer season mm -hmm. and people will, will enjoy it more. That came from an inland an, 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 an inland a sand quarry. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was a sort of a nice balance to allow people to use the beach um, at the same time bringing sand back, you know, back into the system. Right. So, uh, right. Now your project calls for an offshore, uh, what do we call it, a borrow? A borrow site. site. Exactly. There is no way. The scope of our project is so large, we're looking to preserve a three-mile shoreline. And uh, we are estimating that that will take about two and a half million cubic yards of sand. So particularly being an island, it makes the challenge of upland sand source um, right. nearly impossible. I was over there last week and somebody told me that land in Nantucket has become so viable that all the sand, sand pits have uh, nobody digs sand out of them right. anymore because they're more valuable as residential development. Mm -hmm. So any sand for right. this or any other project has to be brought in from the mainland by barge. Right, and it's um, thirty-eight dollars a cubic yard versus if we were to go off and barge at the estimates we've been looking at, range anywhere from eight to twelve 
dollars per cubic yard. So it's significantly more expensive. It makes it more economically unfeasible. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, when you're talking, how many cubic yards? Two and a half million. Okay, at thirty-eight dollars. At thirty-eight dollars okay. versus <laughs> yeah. five to eight, maybe. Yeah. Okay, that's or, That's the range we're hoping to get it in. Uh, the premise here is if, if you could put the sand on the beach, people who haven't been to this part of Nantucket right. should understand. Uh, there are thousands it, of acres yeah. of sand out there, and yeah. those acres were one time probably part of the Sconset Beach, and there are uh, many sand ridges out there that are in places that we will do a lot of data co collection to mm -hmm. ensure that an area that we take the sand from won't have any impact on the shoals or the protective system that's out there to actually help prevent erosion or minimize it. Yeah, one thing we've learned in this commission is you, there's no point at all in taking it from real nearby right? because it'll just go right back right. Uh, in right. no time. And, and, you know, you so we carefully have <laughs> evaluated <laughs> all the different uh, sites out there. One driving a factor was the size of the grain of the sand has mm. to be compatible with the native beach. And so that sort of brought us to several areas that we honed in on, and then we kept narrowing that area down because we found po pockets of compatible sand and then pockets of incompatible. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of research going into trying to identify the source of the best sand that will reduce any of the environmental impacts that people are concerned about or provide us ways to uh, mitigate them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long was this going to last? Uh, you're the, you're the long-term coastal geologist. Suppose they did what they want to do. How long do you think it would survive out there? I, I think the I think the estimate right now, if I'm correct, is somewhere in the vicinity of 10, maybe 15 years. It, it, they they run models and they they run models you know in the in the um, economic industry as well. So what they do is they look at the past storm climate. They look at the currents, the, the long-term and short-term erosion rates, the composition of the bluffs and so forth, and then they'll come up with their best guess estimate of how long the material may last, mm -hmm. and then that will factor into the cost benefit. So I think they're looking at something in, somewhere in the vicinity, maybe 10 to, 10 to 12 years, before a re-nourishment factor is necessary. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's, that's a common practice in all beach nourishment projects. There'll be, there'll be a life expectancy when approximately 50% of the material will have eroded away naturally, and then it's time to gear up to do a re-nourishment project to, to make Make sure your uh, design parameters are met, meaning that the bluff will be protected from storm waves and ultimately in infrastructure and the houses will be protected. So probably I would guess 10 to 12 years if the storm climate remains the same as it has in the past. We're not projecting quite as optimistic of results in our actual draft EIR. We believe that it will be more of five to seven years uh, oh. that we'll get only because a lot of the models are based on experience and we haven't had a lot of experience with beach nourishment in the highly dynamic ocean like Sconset. So I think that even the best of the coastal engineers realize that we have quite mm -hmm. a challenge to design a beach and some supportive yeah. structures that will retain this profile. So we have determined that a five to seven year life expectancy would give us the benefit we want. And we're hoping in that time that the state of Massachusetts gets more involved in helping mm -hmm property owners preserve their shorelines and that new technology and that perhaps we even get involved in some of the federal funding that other states are enjoying as we sort of sit passively yes. by and watch our shorelines erode, we aren't really getting with the benefit that many other states are getting. Right. Well, that's one reason this commission was formed. We did look around <coughs> and notice that uh, Massachusetts contributes little or nothing of its own money right. and it doesn't bring in any federal money and basically the, there is no there's no program at all right. at the state level. Florida to, to actually has make a these program where they actually um, put some money in their annual budget. It used to be 30 million. Someone told me recently it might have gone up to 50 million. Mm -hmm. And then actually during storm events, they pass supplemental budgets. So they actually leverage money with individual communities. If the community will bring some money to the table, then the state will, and usually the counties will, and mm -hmm. then FEMA. So together they have pieced uh, public funding together to get these activities going to preserve their economy. And I would just uh, make a comment that while our season may be short, tourism is and has historically been either the second or third means of economy in Massachusetts. And so while maybe it's a short season, it sure brings in a big influx of cash particularly into the Cape and the Islands region. In Nantucket, tourism really is its economy. 
and so I think preserving our beaches for that purpose. And I know the Chamber of Commerce did a survey of why people come to the Cape and the Islands, and the majority of them, it's for our beaches. So I think it makes mm. a great economic sense. Many of our municipalities struggling with the state funding. If we were to lose some of those tax resources, I know many communities, 15 to 20 percent of their operating budget comes from shoreline properties. So. I think there are many reasons for us as a state and as a community to look at what we can do to preserve our shorelines. That, that was the purpose of this commission, uh, which, as you mentioned, we, we didn't have a policy and we didn't even have a commission, but at least we, we have a commission, and unlike most of them, uh, it's got a deadline yeah. of November to come right. up with a report. So mm -hmm. Jim and a bunch of other mm -hmm. folks have been unpaid uh, doing, a lot, <laughs> doing a lot of work on this thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but we will have a report in, in November. I think it's going to have to include an answer to the question of funding, an answer to the question of right. where you get the sand. And, and one thing we've run across is the sort of lack of coordination between sometimes the people who are dredging in places like the canal and the places that need sand for their beaches or for their shorefront. And sometimes the twain don't meet. Is, is, is that fair to say? <laughs> yes, it is. In, in fact, the, the working group that, I, that I'm co-chairing um, one of one of our I'll tell you one of our recommendation one of our recommendations is to ensure that the coordination particularly with um, particularly with the Corps of Engineers the county dredge uh, which dredges about 29 channels around the around the Cape already pumps all of the material all the sanding material up on usually public eroding beaches that are nearby mm -hmm. uh, However, the Corps of uh, the Corps of Engineers and their major pro uh, projects like the both ends of the Cape Cod Canal which produce significant volumes of beach compatible sand I mean, historically has um, dumped that material in the near shore environment now keeping it in the near shore environment is a is a good secondary alternative but it's obvious that the primary alternative should be to to pump beach com all beach compatible sand back up on beaches which is a state policy now it's encouraged uh, rather than put up hard engineering structures to protect upland properties beach nourishment or soft or non-structural erosion control alternatives are preferred they're more compatible with the environment the problem historically has been is that um, we have not got into the planning process early enough to ensure one that the that beach nourishment is the preferred alternative. Identify the eroding beaches that could use the sand the most, uh, and three, ensure that the right type of dredge comes up that has the capacity to be able to hydraulically pump it up on the beach. And I think that's what happened, um, as we were speaking about earlier, I think that's what happened with Chappaquoit Beach. We just didn't get in the process early enough mm -hmm. to ensure that we had the beaches identified, did the environmental analysis, and ensure that the right equipment is brought up to be able to barge it and then hydraulically pump it on shore. But it is, um, it is a preferable option to, to do beach nourishment for shore protection because it is much more environmentally compatible and it, and it helps the system and it helps the property owners as well. Mm -hmm. And I think as a citizen and as someone who's trying to help uh, property owners preserve their shoreline, I'm hoping the commission provides some structure to all of this for folks. It seems to me we have some obligation to tell people what is permittable. I think the system <coughs> doesn't, enhance, it doesn't facilitate an individual to know what to do to protect their shoreline. And to me, it seems like if you have certain environment or conditions that they could at least send you in some direction of what do we think is acceptable here. And we seem to just have a, a no attitude, which doesn't really sit well with me and yeah. my sort of reasoning and fairness. And yeah, I remember the first time Jim came to speak to the commission that we talked about uh, the, your project. And somebody said, well, that'll be five years in, in permitting. and. Uh, that, I think, why? It would and, be my and, question. That was the first question everyone in the commission had. Why would it possibly take five years to just evaluate a proposal uh, of this nature? I mean, they, they could take a yes and they could take a no, but, but, but five years of spending money on consultants is, is, it doesn't seem to help anybody, except right. the consultants. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. what the, what the, I, I, I won't defend a, you know, the length of time that permitting takes, but I, but I, but I will say that um, you do need a certain amount of baseline information to be able to analyze a project properly. You can you can model the near shore dynamics, the erosion rate and the wave climate and the currents and so forth. I think that, that could be done in a relatively quick manner with the technology that we have today. One of the big issues is the, the, the borrow site. It, it, to go out and just 
analyze the borrow, borrow site on a very short-term basis, you really don't get the complete picture of what, what lives there or what may be a migratory species that may use the area for a short period of time. So at, at least a minimum, I, I would suggest not being a marine biologist, but a minimum of a, a yearly cycle to understand what the complete processes are, biological and physical, um, would need to be done to do an analysis. Now beyond that, um, that the marine fisheries experts would have to take it beyond that to say whether or not one year seasonal cycle is enough to determine what, what would be impacted by the removal of some of that material. And, yeah. uh, and we are handicapped by the fact they don't have baseline data f for most of these places. So, right. so the applicant has to go out and find it, or at least... Uh, right, but there is existing data, and one of the points we try to make is that once you do some of the baseline data that Jim suggests and you get a picture of what it looks like out there, what the habitat is at the different times of year, and then there is data from other places, the Materials Management Service of the federal government has lots of studies and they use one year of data and compare places that have similar, similar characteristics. So I think that to say other existing data is absolutely useless in evaluating these proposals to me seems crazy and that we're just delaying the ability of people to be able to protect their shorefront. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a very site. It is a very site-specific process. If you know, right. if one entity is looking over here, they may have sufficient data, but to come around the other side of the island, there may not be sufficient data there. But I will say that another recommendation from our working group right. to the commission is going to be to do an exhaustive study of, of potential sand and gravel deposits for beach nourishment. Begin that process now, mm -hmm. because I think that is going to be the future of Massachusetts shore protection. Mm -hmm. If we keep armoring, we're seeing we're losing right. our beaches. So I think. The, 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 the future has to be bringing material in either from an offsite shore source or offshore and to begin that process now by looking up where these sources are I think is a critical critical right. thing to begin right. immediately well I think we have one one pilot program at the ready here uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> if people want to actually do do a major beach nourishing project in Massachusetts uh, certainly the, the Nantucket one is quite likely to be first but but if it works there we, we've got a whole lot of beaches on Cape Cod and in Falmouth that uh, that we'd like to save, and it's clearly armoring is not the way anymore. Uh, if nourishment is the way, let, let's find out how to do it and do it right. I, I think that's where the commission is probably going to be heading, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. hopefully by November we'll have a report, and uh, the report will will give some guidelines to to people like Cheryl and her group, and and, and to the rest of the world uh, as to what, what Cape Cod and the islands can do to uh, save our shorelines. And our beaches, uh, which, as you point out, are the most economically uh, stimulative thing we have here in Cape Cod, uh, even now, and on the islands. So th this is welcome, uh, <coughs> not a welcome anymore, but thank you for joining us uh, for this edition of the Chugman Report. Uh, my guests, Jim O'Connell and Cheryl Bartlett, uh, talking about the disappearing beaches on Cape Cod, and uh, hopefully uh, with, with their expertise and, and energy, we'll, we'll be able to report in a couple of years that uh, we, we've got an answer to, uh, to that problem. So, hope so. <laughs>
as I continue to look at the data, what I'm finding is, is that the short-term rates, particularly since the 1950s, have significantly accelerated in most areas, uh, most areas that I'm uh, studying. You can see here, what we did was we plotted the erosion rates around Cape Cod. Most of the, um, most of the erosion um, rates that are taking place here are on, mostly on, uh, on open ocean shores. These are the red lines where areas are eroding greater than two feet per year. Really, the only areas that are accreting are the areas that are updrift of major jetties, groins, and particularly the downside of barrier beaches. Most of the other areas around the state, other than those areas, are showing long-term erosional trends over the last 20 years. I want you to keep in mind two fundamental concepts of coastal processes. And one is the erosion of our glacial uplands provides the great majority of sand, pebble, gravel, and cobble that feeds and allows for the existence of our beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches. Without the erosion of our glacial uplands, we wouldn't have beaches, we wouldn't have dunes, we wouldn't have barrier beaches, and all the biological resources that exist landward of these barrier beaches, such as salt marshes, tidal flats, shellfish beds, and so forth. So the primary source of sand that feeds these resources comes from the erosion of our glacial uplands. The second concept <coughs> that I'd like you to keep in mind as we go along is that once that sand ends up on the beach, it moves somewhere. It gets picked up primarily by wind-generated waves, which create currents, longshore currents. And in those currents moves sand, pebble, and during storms, sometimes gravel and cobble. So we have a continual mechanism of supply of sand and the movement of that sand, which goes to somebody else's property or to another resource, be it another beach, barrier beach, or, or coastal dune system. One other thing I want you to keep in mind as we go along is one of the important provisions in the state wetlands protection regulations, which is required to be implemented by all coastal communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and that is, is that you cannot structurally armor a coastal bluff that's eroding and providing sediment to a beach if it's proposed to protect a building that was built after August 10, 1978. That's the promulgation date of the state wetlands protection regulations. So if your house was built after August 10, 1978, and you're on top of a bluff, and it's eroding, and you're about to lose your property, by law, you can't structurally armor it with a seawall or a vetment. You need to think of some alternative erosion management method, which I'll, pres I'll present several of those as we go along. And the second provision of that regulation also states that the house has to be in jeopardy of loss due to erosion before it can be legally armored. <coughs> that's because of the, we've recognized the importance of the material that's coming out of this bluff for the continued existence of these other natural resources, the beaches, dunes, and barrier beaches. I want to jump now from, uh, from Morris Island, jump right around to the other side in uh, Cockle Cove in the town of Chatham. It has a very serious invas invasive species problem called codium. You'll see some of it washing up here, but the further you travel west along the south side of the Cape, the codium gets thicker and thicker. But <coughs> this was a severely eroding beach. They had a very serious codium problem, rotting, smelling, uh, not very pleasant. So what the town of Chatham did, particularly uh, Ted Keon, who's the chief of the Coastal Resource Department in Chatham, a very creative, very creative um, coastal resource manager in the town of Chatham, worked for the Philly District of uh, Corps of Engineers for a long time. He decided that, well, we're going to dredge about 30,000 cubic yards of sand from a channel two miles east of here, Stage Harbor. Is there a way we can hydraulically pump that 30,000 cubic yards of sand onto this beach and create a feeder beach? but it will slowly erode and feed all the other public beaches along the south side of Chatham, which is precisely what they did. They got the codfish, which is the county dredge, to hydraulically, hydraulically pump approximately 20 and then an additional uh, 10,000 cubic yards for a total of about 30,000 cubic yards of sand pumped on this beach. It's slowly eroding, but as the sand erodes, it's going right back, feeding the beaches along that way, which I thought was a, a pretty uh, very creative and win-win situation. <coughs> there was one property owner who didn't want to buy into the walking rights so they had to bypass that one particular piece of property who now enjoys a beautiful wide sandy beach because sand migrates and continues to migrate. A uh, little blurry here uh, when you're flying in small planes that will happen occasionally. This is, the, this is the south side of the Cape here, but you can see, I <coughs> like this because you can see the offsets of what all the joint groins and all the jetties are doing. <coughs> We're in the, uh, on the Harwich area here on the south side of the Cape. Here's the Her Herring River. But you can see that it's, it is trapping a lot of sand, but it's causing a lot of perturbations in the shore and some problems for the people who are immediately down drift of some of these uh, groins and jetties. This is in the town of Dennis here. You see much of it is already revetted, but they also have all these groins here uh, <coughs> going around the beach. This is the um, C Street um, public beach here. I'm going to bring you on the ground here just so you can get a feeling for what the ground looks like uh, in, this, in these particular locations. This is what it looks like on the ground. 
This is the public parking, uh, par parking area up here. They have a, some small semblance of a dry beach there, but they're, again, they've basically uh, cut off the sediment supply, but they're trying to slow the migration by <coughs> maintaining, uh, maintaining these hundreds and hundreds of uh, groins that we see along the shore. Uh, <coughs> we're moving a little bit further west now, coming, uh, heading towards, uh, towards Falmouth. Here's one of the, another one of the public beaches here. The groins, this groin here is a little bit longer, so it's trapping a little bit more sand. Of course, it's preventing it down here. You can see that as a result, these folks have had to build revetments because they're not getting the sand <coughs> filtering around this lawn growing here. But it's another, another, public, uh, another public beach projects that I, that I know of along, that took place along the south side of the Cape. They pumped up about 90,000 cubic yards of sand from the inlet just off the, uh, just off the, um, off the, uh, off the screen here. So about 90,000 cubic yards of sand uh, went up on this beach uh, back in the early 1990s. Again, it was one of three uh, beach nourishment projects on the south side of the Cape. This is what it looks like on the ground. The high water was up to this wall. This wall goes on the entire length of Long Beach here. There's Craigville Beach over in this location here. But they pumped that 90,000 cubic yards. Several years ago, they pumped up another <coughs> uh, ten, uh, uh, several tens of uh, thousands of cubic yards of sand to maintain this beach. But it's, but it's been relatively successful. It's a relatively low wave climate. So some of these small beach nourishment projects, this went along about a mile of beach. Some of these small beach nourishment projects, I think, are a, a real attractive alternatives to some of our coastal armoring if we can find an adequate volume and grain size of sand that's not going to affect essential fish habitat. <coughs> Just moving using our, our beaches. This is on the western shore of Wakoit Bay. This was a small beach nourishment, small beach nourishment project that took place in uh, May, uh, May uh, 2003. Jeff Williams from uh, USGS, when he was on the Conservation Commission, turned me on to this project. We made several site visits since it was, <coughs> since it was built here, just to see if, if it was a, a reasonable alternative to turn to in some of our bays and estuaries. That was May 03. By December 03, by December 03 most of the beach sand that they put on the beach um, had been lost. But, um, but interestingly enough, if you go back today, I went back there just last month, this was in 2004, even though the beach is being affected, a lot of the upland area here, the grass is still very, very healthy, but the upland dune that they built is still intact, providing significant uh, buffer to storm waves. So I think, it's a, I think it's a reasonable alternative to attempt on a few more cases and see if it can be a reasonable alternative to coastal army. This uh, gentleman, according to Jeff, actually came in for, um, for a revetment proposal to armor the bluff. And he decided he would try this. And, and again, I think it's a, a reasonable alternative to attempt in some of our bays and some of our estuaries beaches. Another one of my beautiful postcards. Actually, this one was uh, postmarked 1908. This is Falmouth Heights Beach. Unfortunately, I found the same house right here. So you see, this is the way it looked like in 1908. All the grass, a little you know, nice four dune there, some beach. And here's where we have a vertical wall here. But the sandy beach doesn't, doesn't look that lower. And I tried to get in touch with um, Don Hoffer and others to see whether or not the town had been supplementing the, uh, the beach over the years. And I'm sure there's several people in the audience who could probably answer that question. But I just wanted to show you a little comparison here. Uh, above yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the surf drive, which you see here from an aerial photograph in 1994 that I took on a plane ride that I was taking. There's surf drive here, very, very narrow <coughs> barrier beach. This is actually um, a success story in a way. After, October, um, after the um, Hurricane Bob in August of 1990, there were a number of houses that were washed off their foundation or completely destroyed. Some of the houses did survive. Some of the houses that washed into the backside of the bluff, I actually witnessed them coming back on trailers, actually being placed back on the beach, born on open pilings, elevated, <coughs> most of them above the 100-year flood elevation. But the federal government came in <coughs> with the help of the 300 committee and the, and the town government, and actually purchased six lots for about $700,000 from willing sellers along this beach. That acquisition program now is still available, but only for communities that have a FEMA-improved hazard, um, hazard mitigation plan in place. So there are still monies available, but you've got to put together that hazard mitigation plan. 13 of the 15 communities on the Cape have approved hazard mitigation plans at the present time. But they did buy six lots at about $700,000. The feds kicked in 600,000 of that, and through the wonderful efforts of the 300 committee and the town government, um, they did or they basically orchestrated the purchase of some of those properties, which is now town-owned and town-managed uh, property. But what is the future of Surf Drive itself? I don't have the answer at the present time, but it's something something to think about. You know, we know that the high water line is pretty much pretty close to Surf Drive. There's an equivalent project happening on Martha's Vineyard called Beach Road. Identical situation we have here. Beautiful scenic drive. People are not willing to give up the scenic drive on Martha's Vineyard, and I'm sure here as well. 
But what are we going to do with that road that goes along that very narrow, low-lying barrier beach? With storms, and particularly with sea level rise facing us in the future, something's going to have to be done there. Beach nourishment project, which will probably be the most compatible thing to do, but I can't, uh, I can't see that road being abandoned, perhaps, but perhaps after a major storm, everybody in town is going to have to stand back and sit back and say, what do we want to do? And it's going to be up to you folks, to, at least the residents, to decide what's going to be the most appropriate action. I would suggest that, um, I would hope that somebody would be searching the offshore now for, p for possibly large volumes of compatible sand and maybe rebuild the beaches. Um, <coughs> perhaps a win-win situation. Just surf drive during a, basically during a storm. I had mentioned that, you know, as long as you land with a high water. I wanted to now come around and surf drive around Knopska Point here. Again, what a photograph I took in 2004. Go to Knopska Beach here. Flanked in between two sediment sources that are now completely armored. More than likely the sediment supply to this beach. But I did happen to find a, a postmark 1905 postcard of, um, of Knopska Beach here and went back in 2003 and tried to stand in the same location and take the same photograph. It doesn't look like it's changed all that much. It looks, it looks pretty much the same. You can see the road on the back side, the road on the back side. You can even, you even see this little indent here. On the long-term shoreline change data, this is, this is supposed to be eroding at approximately a half a foot per year based on that long-term average. <coughs> but it looks, looks, um, it looks pretty, pretty decent. I'm going to move now from, uh, from the South Shore and move up onto the, into the Buzzard Bay area, up onto the Woodneck Beach area. And you've probably been reading in the Falmouth Enterprise some of the efforts that the town has been doing to try and maintain this, this public recreational beach. But in November 2004, I happened to be at this beach, and I, every, everywhere I go, I carry my camera with me. So I took pictures of beaches from everywhere I go. This was November 2004. Very narrow, relatively narrow beach, full of cockle shells. Then we had that December 6, 2005 storm with those 100 mile per hour winds blowing across the bay. Um, the sky didn't fall. You can see this is what it looked like. This was January of 2006, about a month after that December, uh, um, about a month after that December storm hit. We had some dune scarping, some minor dune scarping. The beach looks a little bit wider, actually, um, wider. The dunes did precisely what they're designed to do by nature, which is erode and provide sand to that near shore area. So there was a November. Here it is right after the post storm. The issue with, the, I think, I think <coughs> the main issue with this was the overwash that went into the parking lot through the pedestrian walkways, which were perpendicular to the shore. Most communities now have learned to jog the walkway so that when the overwash comes up, it's going to hit an obstruction and slow down and not um, put all that overwash. But that's what barrier beaches do. They overwash, they migrate landward. If they don't migrate landward, they're going to erode away. So most of the overwash went through the, uh, went through the, um, the walkways. Here's the overwash sands here. Um, I had a discussion with the town officials suggesting that this is part of the Barrier Beach process. And, you can, and anybody who goes there at a moon tide or an elevated storm tide, half the parking lot in this location that's off the screen is underwater. The marsh is immediately on the back side. That parking lot's in trouble. The parking lot's going to be underwater pretty soon if they don't do something about it. So the natural process of that Barrier Beach migrating landward and elevating, naturally elevating the, the parking lot is probably a good thing. The issue was is that it's sand and that you can't drive a two-wheel vehicle on sand. And the people who use this beach, are, uh, I was told, are passionate about it as a public recreational resource. <coughs> so they basically bulldoze with this material back up onto the beach, into piles here, and then spread that material back on the beach itself. And this is what the beach basically looks like now. It's a little bit wider, a little bit higher, but the parking lot is still low and very vulnerable. I think they're eventually going to have to bring material at the point now here. Um, they were, um, there was a plan attempting to get the sand out of the Cape Cod Canal from the Corps of Engineers dredging on the west side. That didn't come to fruition. The Corps of Engineers primarily said because he didn't come early enough to get it into the planning process. Um, but they, there was a, uh, and I'm hoping that perhaps the next time they do dredge the, uh, the west end of the canal, perhaps they could find, uh, I think preferably a public recreational beach that may be eroding that everybody can enjoy and hopefully bring that material down and supplement the loss of that material. Uh, I'm just traveling up and just going to show you a couple of pictures a little bit further up of the shore of Buzzards Bay. This is, uh, this is uh, Wing Neck here. You can see that's been significantly armored here, basically to protect some of the property. Uh, moving up a little bit further, getting close to the Cape Cod Canal now. You can see the area up here, much of the Buzzards Bay shore, particularly on the, on the, um, the west-facing uh, shore and Falmouth and Bourne has been armored over the years, per, again, to protect that very valuable waterfront uh, property at the expense, I'm afraid, of the, of the beach and the dunes. Uh, 
Oh, I wanted to bring you up uh, just up to up to Bourne. Now, the National Weather Service has predicted in the upper parts, upper reaches of Buzzards Bay, during a severe hurricane, they could probably get upwards of a 25-foot storm surge predicted in the upper reaches of Buzzards Bay, and I think they're preparing for it. This is Bourne. <laughs> this is Bourne. Again, I do a lot of kayaking, and I, I do get a lot of my photographs on these, but this is what um, some of the upper reaches of Bourne look like. Now, these, a lot of these houses were destroyed uh, during subsequent, uh, previous storms, like Hurricane Bob, for example, which was a relatively minor hurricane. <coughs> so, uh, but this is what, um, now that is the 100-year flood elevation. That's the calculated 100-year flood elevation under uh, severe storm conditions. So we'll see how that um, survives uh, during the this next This is storm. the opening slide that I showed you. This is the eastern shore of Nantucket. You can imagine what the value of this waterfront property is here on the eastern shore of Nantucket. It's enormous. Million, five million dollar houses, and they're obviously threatened loss due to erosion. <coughs> to armor a couple of projects here with revetments or bulkheads or whatever it may be would probably be not very effective for a long period of time. So what they opted for, <coughs> oh, let, me just, let me just jump down a little bit off the screen here. Uh, this is Codfish Park. This is just to the south of those houses that I showed you in a dune area. These houses here no longer exist. This road is what's left here. This if you look at the long-term shoreline change data for this particular site here, Codfish Park, it shows that the, the it shows that this beach over 150 years is accreting. So if you looked at the long-term data, you'd say, "What a great place to build." Well, these built these houses were built about 100 years ago. They're the old shacks at one time. The problem is this: so if you look at 150 years of data, for 100 years that beach was accreting. Somewhere around the 1950s, that accretion trend reversed and turned into erosion. And it's been eroding anywhere between 5 and 10 feet on average per year since the 1950s. But if you calculate it over the long term as one number, it shows it's accreting. That's the importance of looking at that entire data set, particularly the more short-term data. So this is the beach down here. The road is right behind this dune here. That's where those houses built. That, that's where whole, those houses were built. The water was actually up to the dune line at one time. The sand has come back. <coughs> So it's a very alternating cycle for, for a variety of reasons, which we're figuring out now. But back up to these other areas here. What they've opted for along this, um, along this shore is a major beach nourishment project. Right now, they're offshore, about three miles offshore. There's three sandbars. If you look at a bathymetric chart, that third sandbar is about three miles offshore. They're looking to see whether it's feasible. One, if the grain size is compatible with the beach, it has to be slightly coarser than the native beach uh, sand here. And they're looking at anywhere between uh, one and a half to two and a half million cubic yards of sand to be pumped up on this beach at a cost of, I believe, now about $20 million. The project is designed to have a life expectancy before renourishment is expected, somewhere in the vicinity of 10, maybe 15 years, if the storm climate is the same as they're calculating uh, using their models. But they are now, as we speak, looking at these offshore sand sources, about three miles offshore, to see if it's feasible for them to remove, skim some of that, um, some of that bar up here, and bring it inshore and, and hydraulically pump it up onto the beach. These people over the years have tried a number of things. Right now, while they're looking for this sand source to, to recreate this beach nourishment project, they've done a number of things. Right now, what they're doing is that they're taking a biodegradable <coughs> um, burlap uh, matting, very thick, thick matting, and they're maybe three or four feet in diameter, three or four feet high, and they're putting three rows across, and then another row on top, and then another one on top, then completely covering it, and then covering all of that with sand in an, in an, uh, in an effort to try and slow the erosion of the bluff to see whether or not it's feasible to get this beach nourishment project, uh, beach nourishment project uh, through, the, through the permitting process. What they've tried over the year, this is where the experimental beach-based dewatering system was installed in the early 1990s. The theory of that was, in the beach are these <coughs> perforated pipes. The theory is, is when a wave breaks on the beach, it swashes up the beach, and in that swash is sand. Then you have the backrush coming down. The backrush pulls the sand back down with it, and it moves along the shore in a zigzag fashion. Well, what if the swash came up on the beach with the sand in it, and there was a way for us to create a negative pressure and pull the swash down? Would we be able to maintain the sand that was in that swash on the beach? That's the theory of the beach-faced dewatering system, which was tried in a couple of places, North Carolina, another place in Florida, but, um, with marginal, questionable success. But, um, but the proponents will suggest that it did in some cases, slow the erosion rate down. So they tried that in the early, they installed it in the early 1990s. Uh, because it's such an extremely open ocean area, uh, it, it failed a lot. The, there's three discharge pipes that take the swash 
and discharge it out in back into the ocean. But because it's such a vulnerable site, the discharge pipes have been repeatedly damaged. The system sometimes became uncovered and got damaged. So sometimes they would get a some accretion, and when the system shut down, the system very rapidly went back into equilibrium until they turned the system back on and ag again attempted to retain some of that sand. But at the present time, they're, they're, um, they want to supplement that um, keep it in the beach, keep it as a backup, but they want to do try that beach nourishment. They've tried terracing the bluff. They've tried those fiber rolls and the, and the, burlap, <coughs> and the burlap bags. Uh, they've tried drainage systems in front because there's clay in these, some of these bluffs. These are glacial outwashes, clay in them. <coughs> it's clay in them. So they've tried a number of things, and uh, we'll see how this beach nourishment project turns out. It's, it's being planned and going through the permit process as we speak. So my message to you would be, I think, uh, mitigation. Replacing the sand that's being lost from the system, I think, is a must on any type of engineering structure or non-structural project that goes in these days. What some of the communities now are doing is when somebody comes in to repair one of those structures, they're requiring that it be covered with a compensable volume of sand to basically to recreate, uh, recreate some of these systems. I'd like to see a little bit more beach nourishment and some salt marsh, and marsh experimental projects and see if we can provide a little bit more balance into this system. So I hope you enjoyed the tour.